is Nick Christopher with Mob Tales. Um, thanks for joining in. Please like, share, subscribe, most of all. Uh, today we have a very interesting guest, uh, somebody I interviewed one time before. Uh, Steve Rodin, better known as Stevie Bullets. Uh, great guy, fun guy to speak with. Has a lot of interesting stories for us. So, uh, Steve, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. So, uh, yeah, they call me Stevie Bullets. I'm from Cicero, Illinois. Um, currently working on a documentary with uh, producer Dane Forney from Octane Rich Media. Uh, we're doing documentary. My story is a redemption story. I've been out of prison for uh, 11 years. Uh, I was involved with uh, three gangs, 12 street players. Uh, then I got into drugs and went to prison time. Uh, got involved with feds and uh, ended up getting federal number. Uh, you know, and then just being incarcerated, I started uh, meeting different people and, uh, you know, being from Cicero, uh, you know, there's a lot of outfit guys in there. And uh, I had an uncle that, or, or one of the main guys, in Cicero, uh, James Marcello. So as a kid, I was influenced by these things. And, you know, as I got older and stuff and uh, just more and more into the criminal life, uh, you know, I started, you know, learning the ropes and uh, way around. And uh, basically, you know, I got involved with some very dangerous people and I was fortunate enough to be able to walk away from that and uh, get my life together. I got legit. I got involved with the Teamster 7 Union. From there, you know, uh, I got out of prison in 2009, and I had met my wife, and she's comes from a law enforcement family, and that, yeah, that was really the, the turning point in my life was right there. Um, well, you, and, you, you you kind of broke the whole thing down for me before I can even ask a question. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. You, you gave us a, a nice little, um, I mean, you broke down the whole story in like five seconds. It's five seconds. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Because uh, <laughs> um, I, I was in a, because a lot of, you know, some people that are watching may know who you are already. Some people may not. So, I mean, yeah, you gave us just now, you know, a breakdown, pretty much synopsis of, of your life, pretty much. But um, I want to, um, you know, ask you some questions in, in reference to that, you know, and like dating back to the time that you got involved with the, uh, the 12 Street players. Um, yeah. When you got involved with those guys, how old were you at first when you first got involved? Oh, I was 13 years old when I got involved with the 12 Street players. Uh, and that oh. was actually. What, what, uh, before you go on, what, like myself, you know, not as much like you, I mean, you're more than me, but when I was that age, same thing. When I was 13, I was involved with a gang too, when I was 13 years old. Um, same thing like you, but what drew me to them was because I was bullied. Now, what drew you to that life? So, in my neighborhood, 12 Street Players, which was predominantly uh, Italian. You know, there was other ethnicities and stuff, but it was mostly Italian. Uh, and these were the guys that ran the neighborhood. So when I got to about the age of 13, I mean, I knew other gangs in the neighborhood. We had Latin kings, and uh, that was basically it was the two strongest uh, gangs in my neighborhood and i i felt more gravi like gravitated towards wall street players so then when i got to my freshman year of high school um there was a couple guys and stuff and you know they asked me you know and i had already known these guys since i was a kid you know like five six years old so i knew pretty much who these guys were and these guys you know they 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 had the neighborhood pretty much locked down. So when I got to high school, 
you know, and these guys were to me when I was a kid, I, I, I loved uh, all that, all, all the bad stuff, you know, my mom, you know, I went to a Catholic school, but like when I started seeing like Miami Vice on television, I don't know, <laughs> something, something about the criminal life. I, it just like, it, I got a rush from it. You know, I was infatuated with it. I, I like everything. You know, Al Capone and, uh, you know, Mafia um, and, and, and like street gangs, of course, you know, when I, I remember I was probably like seven or eight years old and I would start graffiti and because when I seen these guys, I, I wanted to learn everything about them. You know, that was like, to me, that's what I was drawn towards, unfortunately. And then when I got to my freshman year of high school I already knew who was who and um like I said I I, I met a couple of 12 Street players that I was going to high school with and right away I joined I wasn't even in my freshman year I was actually the summer of my freshman year it was 1992 and then uh, like I said this this was in Berwyn that's really where I originated was from in Berwyn and uh, the violations in, which was, you know, a couple of guys on both sides. And uh, my friend's backyard, backyard. And basically, you got to walk a line and they just be you in. They beat you up, kick, punch, whatever, you know, everything goes and make it all the way to the end, which I did. And then uh, that was basically where I, where I started, you know, and then getting in trouble criminally with the juvenile system um, in and out of the Audi home. And basically that's where it kind of just took off, you know, as round 13. And then it ended so what, so about after, 10 years ago. So after the 12th Street Bowl players, when you spent X amount of time in that, in that you know, with those guys, um, um, you advanced from there. In other words, you took your, you know, criminal life, so to speak, to another level. Um, but you never got, you never really got in with the outfit, really. I mean, you oh. weren't a member or nothing. No, no, no. So I'm not a mate guy. Uh, but I am, uh, I, I'm very familiar with those guys. Uh, I have quite a few friends that are mate guys. Um, I got the respect and how it began was, so of course I'm from Cicero, which there's a lot of guys that are involved in the outfit and Cicero and the crew. Um, I, like I said, my uncle, as a kid, uh, my uncle worked for James Marcello, which was a ranking member of the, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the doorman and uh, basically ran the club for the guys. So I got familiar as a kid uh, about the Cicero outfit. And, you know, of course, my mom and dad, my mom was Italian. Her last name is Messina. Uh, she she kind of, you know, she didn't condone that part of her ancestry. So she didn't like me to glorify. But, of course, I did. <laughs> so when she had told me stories about, you know, um, like my grandfather, he was part of the two was the predecessor for uh, outfit. Uh, my grandfather, and I learned this because like growing up, I seen my grandmother had a lot of money and, you know, I just started noticing things. So I asked my mother, you know, how my grandmother had made, like how she had all this money. And she basically told me that my grandfather is part of the syndicate and, you know, of course, the syndicate is the mafia here in Chicago. And that's when I first learned about it. And then I started Googling and doing some research, ancestry, and finding out more and more stuff about my grandfather, my great grandfather, actually. And uh, then my uncle, when I started doing my documentary, uh, my uncle filled me in on more stuff and he helped me with facts about uh, stuff that my grandfather was involved with, stuff that he was involved with. 
And uh, then, you know, going to prison and stuff, I started meeting different individuals. One of them was Harry Allman, out at uh, Hitman. And I had previously been locked up with his grandson. So when we were incarcerated in Cook County Jail, which was probably about five or six years previous to me meeting Harry Allman, uh, he had already told me that he had a grandfather. Of course, I didn't know. You know I thought it was just a jailhouse and stuff. Somebody told me. And then I ended up down in Galesburg uh, Correctional Center. This was around 2007. And when I got down there, you know, I had met Harry Allman when I was going on a visitation with my wife. He told me, you know, in the park. And I, we, I had heard that his name was Harry the Hitman. And then, like I said, he, at this time, he was old. He was really old. Uh, he was one of the guys that uh, was uh, charged with, it was a double jeopardy case. You know, he's tried twice for the same murder. And the first time it was a uh, bribery to a judge or some, something like that. But anyways, he was a outfit hit man. Uh, like I said, I had met him down in Galesburg prison and uh, he ended up dying shortly after from uh, cancer. And then, uh, you know, just being in prison, uh, you meet, you meet different people, leaders of gangs, stuff like that. And then of course I was involved with drugs. Uh, selling and using a lot of drugs and, and then started getting acquainted with like the Latino gangs and uh gangs here in Chicago. So seeing the way they operated, meeting those individuals uh from different uh gangs, uh, I started to utilize that as I got older, you know, benefit me in the streets. And uh like I said, uh, uh, I had, you know, really deeply involved with street gang shooting. I'd been shot myself 11 times. Twice I was shot in the head. Uh, that's how I acquired the name Stevie Bullet. Uh, actually, a police officer gave me the name. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, and see, I was involved with a lot of police, too, you know, because at first I was public enemy number one. Because I, as a juvenile, um, I was always in and out of trouble. Started off with uh, stealing cars, and then it escalated to burglaries, uh, uh, robbing houses. Then I started doing armed robberies. Uh, this is all. This is all under the Twelfth Street Boys. Were you doing those or after? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the Twelfth Street Players, you know, it's pretty much. Uh, a lot of these guys, like I said, they're from their Italian ancestry, and uh, a lot of their their family members were members, high ranking members, some of them. Um, and uh, you know, they had the same mentality. You know, it's not a secret. You know, I'm not disclosing like anything. You know, out to the public that's not known, and it's a big part of my documentary. So, like when I started doing it. Of course, a lot of my guys, they don't condone that type of stuff in public. But, you know, I had a lot of meetings, sitting down and discussions with these guys. And I got respect from them. And, uh, you know, we just came to, like, uh, an understanding. You know, I respect everybody. I don't have no reason to uh, put anybody out there or invite any of these people and stuff like that. But, you know, I wanted to do my uh, documentary. And uh, it actually worked out, you know, and I got a lot of support from the neighborhood. Well, these guys, uh, like I said earlier, well, before I even get to that question, with the 12th Street players, did you guys need to kick up to the outfit to support to, to operate? No, that, no, not that, not to my knowledge. I, I mean, could have been maybe. <laughs> Well, just to be safe about it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, they've been known to to do uh, business with the outfit. I could say that much without. Well, you guys were like a, a farm team, no? 
put it up. They, right. would, they would come yep. pick up guys if they wanted or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So what made yeah. you, what made you not, not so much not fit in, but what was it, did you, were you approached to possibly be involved or, or no? Yeah, so this, so like I said, you know, going uh, in and out of prison and, you know, getting my name out in the streets, uh, I got to know who was who and uh, I, I, ha I had been doing business with some of these individuals. Some of them were police officers and um, uh, I ended up getting, um, that's how I ended up getting my first federal case uh, was for perjury. Um, it was a Cicero police sergeant and uh, I had lied under oath, you know, to protect him because individuals that we were both uh, friends with and, you know, I, like I said, I had uh, committed perjury and that's how I got my federal number. Um, well, you, uh, the was, that was around what, 2000, 2005 or something like that? Yeah, yeah, 2000, 2004, 2005. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I had, it, like I said, in my neighborhood, everybody's familiar with each other. So we, it was pretty much just a favor that I was doing for another friend of mine. And it kind of backfired. Like I said, I ended up getting a perjury. The officer ended up and stuff. And uh, yeah, it was just a real bad deal. Everything yeah. that happened. Well, it wasn't only that, it was, um, Around 2000, July 13th, I was with a friend of mine and there was so much animosity built up between me and the police, Cicero and the Berlin police that, uh, and ended up, uh, police officer shot and killed my friend. Shot him in the back of the head. There was no gun. Uh, you know, I felt like it was because of you know their animosity and hatred toward me that me and this police officer had uh we had like a personal beef at one time we were friends um we're acquaintances who we'll probably said not say that we were friends but we were acquainted with each other so we were familiar with each other uh he became a police officer of course i was involved with speaking uh he had some differences between us and then he approached us what they are going to say is in the middle of a drug transaction and we took off running fleeing and looting. and uh as my friend was jumping over the fence or shot him in the back of the head and killed him oh to my knowledge there was no gun recovered and uh you know, it it, it just and it, it just started from there. So after that, it was pretty much back and forth with us and the police. And then, like I said, I had met my wife in 2006. So I had been in and out of the system. My wife's family was all law enforcement. Uh, we're, we're married now. We've been together 11 years. I still live in the same town and all this stuff happened. Uh, everything pretty much, I turned it around positive, you know, uh, I, mm -hmm. I have a good relationship with the police now and not as far as like information and stuff like that, but just respect wise, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I, it, I find it very interesting. Like when you met Lucia, um, after a little while, you went you went away for like two years, if I remember correctly, and, yeah, you were writing, yeah. and you were writing letters to her back and forth to try to keep her, not to let her, not to, not to not for her to run away. And, yeah. Uh, when you came out, she stuck around for you, which is very good, and you came out and obviously you know redeemed yourself, whatever. You guys got married, so forth and so on. How did I don't understand? I, I can imagine 
the how difficult it might have been for you to prove to her family, which is law enforcement, law enforcement background, how you were able to convince them that I'm going to be a good boy. I can't go nothing wrong. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> well, I mean, so once, you know, my, me and my wife ended up having our first child and I started around the family, you know, they actually embraced me very well. They didn't, you know, hold my past against me. And, uh, you know, they gave me benefit of the doubt. And uh, I just, once I got the respect and, you know, I, 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 I started holding myself to a higher standard because I didn't want to let these people down, you know, and I didn't want to lose my family. I didn't want to lose my wife, of course. And uh, like I said, now we have three children. We've been together now for 11 years. I'm pretty active in the community now. Oh, you know. that's awesome. Okay. Now, mentioning, getting back to what you said earlier in the interview, you mentioned about getting involved with Octane Films with James Forney. Yes. Now you're in the in the cusp of coming out with your own documentary. Um, and obviously, the documentary follows your life, you know, what prior to where you are now. Um, how far are you in the production of that of that uh, project? So we're going to do a screening on May 11th at uh, Fairmont Collections Car Museum here in Chicago. Uh, a friend of mine who's also a retired Chicago police officer was uh, generous enough to offer me uh, place to hold the event, which um, we uh, going to do the screening, which is like, uh, pretty much like a long trailer. You know, I don't know if it's going to be the entire documentary, but, uh, we are going to do the screening there and stuff. People will be able to get a glimpse of actually like, uh, how my stories unfolding and stuff like that. And then hopefully, uh, we're entering into film fest. And from there, you know, hopefully we'll be able to sell the project. No, oh, okay, sounds great. Um, is it um, so? I know I know James is involved with it, who I do know, matter of fact. Um, getting just I'm just getting back to with your background now. Since you've turned yourselves around, you know, you redeemed yourself. You changed your life pretty much. Um, have you ever came across guys you grew up with? that may still be involved, maybe still, may still be active in that world, uh, that, you know, I mean, do you get any slack for saying, yeah, hey, you know, you're, you're chickened out, you're going straight. I mean, do you ever get that kind of, any kind of pushback with that? A little bit over the documentary. That, that, that's basically it, you know, I, I do talk to a lot of guys that are still very active in the street, outfit guys, and, uh, you know, they, as long as I'm not talking about them, they don't have no problem with what I'm doing. A lot of them actually support it. You know, they like it. They <laughs> support it. So, yeah, that's the good thing. And they've actually helped me out with a lot of my, uh, you know, like promoting my story and stuff like that. Oh, you wow. know, so, but yeah. That's actually, but like you said, the documentary itself, you don't really mention, you know, mention names or anything. You're just speaking from your point of view. Am I correct? Correct. Right. Okay. All right. That sounds cool. Now, I mean, just in your thoughts and your opinions, because um, I know a lot of guys from that area in Chicago. Besides yourself, I know a couple of guys from there, uh, like Joey, uh, Joey Seifert, and his brother um, Nick, and I know a couple of other guys out there, like um, um, my guy Frank uh, Calabresi Jr. Um, I know all those guys. Now, in your opinion, do you think the outfit or, you know, the gangster life so is kind of dying out in that, in that area? Yeah, yeah. It's not what it used to be, you know, as far as the structure and uh, organization, like, how it was nice back then. I mean, I could be wrong, but, you know, no, I don't think it's at all. And I think with a lot of the social media, podcast stuff like that died out i mean there is 
you know, still strong crews, you know. And what I mean by crews is like three, four guys that are out there making money. They know better than to be like in the limelight, you know. Yeah. Especially where I'm from. I mean, I know guys for sure that are, you know, very heavily involved, but they, you know, they they don't, you know, or you don't hear about them and stuff like that. Yeah. You know. Well, considering that fact, have you ever been approached by, you know, the FBI or any higher higher uh, enforcement say, hey, Steve, you, uh, we know you know this or we know you know that guy. Can you give us a little bit? Have you ever been approached like that? So yes, I I, I have. Um, my wife, uh, she had a cousin that had went missing in two thousand and nine. Uh, his name is Anthony Catalano, and whatever the circumstances of his disappearance was at the time that I had got out of prison, two thousand and nine. So I had already been previously, you know. Uh, charged with a uh, perjury, so the feds were already familiar with me. And then, of course, when her cousin had went missing, uh, Chicago police had questioned me at one time, and then um, the feds had came and questioned. If was there, and you know there wasn't much to say. And uh, you know I don't know it did, didn't vibrate with them. And then it was maybe like two, three years later, same. And uh, then it was like a third time, you know, and went over and over the same thing with her cousin being missing. And I guess it was because of people that I was, point, you know, friends with, uh, which kind of made it, you know, seem like I had some type of involvement, which I didn't. But, you know, long story short, uh, yeah, uh, my wife had a cousin and it's been like 10 years. It was around the same time that I had got out. Uh, I had already oh. been in trouble with the feds. So, yeah. So they, they, they were assuming that you had maybe something to do with it? Yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. That, we already figured that out, you know. And my wife, like I said, uh, she he had, you know, went crazy on the feds. Um, you know, it wasn't just one or, one or two times. It was, you know, Four times stuff over and over about her and I had told the family members about this you know because I I wanted it to be, I had told the producers you know because I had nothing to hide of course that I wasn't involved with anything criminally but I have a little bit job and uh you know I had nothing to hide so I did tell the producers about this you know, with the feds and, um you know, was it, was, it, was it because Anthony was involved in some way? Is that why? So her cousin was. Her cousin, cousin was yeah. involved. Yeah, he was heavily involved with uh, narcotics. And well, he, they say, you know, when we Google him, uh, he was tied to organized crime. Ah, I got you. Now I understand why. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this is the, the kicker was I'm uh, friends with the doctor. I'm not going to mention quickly, but uh, there was a doctor that was uh, they called him Dr. William Pills. He was there in Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, he he his name was mentioned in an article. And me and the doctor have discussed this, uh, and because the doctor's name was involved, uh, they wrote some article about him. They called him Dr. William Pills. Uh, his wife's a Playboy playmate, so it was like a big. Well, we're we're really good friends. Uh, me and the doctor, our sons are both autistic. By the way, they go to the same school. It's just by coincidence. So that, that was probably more of the reason too was that I'm friends with this doctor in particular. But you know, it is what it is. You know, I mean, yes, of course. Well, I, I think that um, the other interesting thing I'd like to say before we, uh, I know you have something, something at 445, I remember you mentioned um, uh, your time, rather. Um, you, uh, I'm just impressed with your wife and how she stuck by you. I think it's pretty impressive. 
because uh, a lot of guys who do go away, you know, they, usually their 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 wives never stick around, most of the time. <laughs> Uh, but Segura stuck around, which is pretty impressive. Um, how is how has she uh, her mood or her her um, attitude towards this whole you doing these shows like mine and the documentary and everything? I mean, so, she seems to be pretty supportive. So this is the other thing. My wife actually, um, she's a volleyball coach at Catholic school. There's there both of our daughters. Both uh, she's full-time mom. She doesn't have to work. Uh, so she's always volunteering at the school. Um, she's um, best friends with the Cook County judge. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. she And uh, yeah, no, my wife totally, uh, she supports all, all the podcasts and uh, the documentary. Of course, it's like I said, it's the message I send is, you know, redemption. You know, it's not to glorify, like, criminal, you know, be involved with things and It's just about, I was so far deep in the streets that I was lucky enough to turn around, you know, and, uh, and not become a statistic. And now I'm, you know, a legit Teamster 703. Oh, you know, I, uh, fight for union contracts and stuff. so I, I i love my job if you follow me here on facebook and stuff i'm all about company. i work for a great company you know oh very cool so in every aspect in my life i've been able to you know be very successful and you know go a different way right of course okay well if you can you just share us one more? Well, the, the thing you're doing for, with um, the documentary, is it going to be only premiering in one location or more than one? Uh, hopefully more than one. Because, okay. like I said, he'll, he'll do the screening so that, you know, I'm guessing maybe 50 to 75 people come there. It'll be a private screening. And they'll get a taste of, you know, what we're there's the storyline and stuff like because it can go a couple different ways you know uh right now it's just that a short doc 30 to 40 minutes that's on and that's can you tell that's on may 11th am i correct yeah may 11th and where would it be again yeah uh they're my collections i'm sorry what's where, where would it be at uh clear my collections clear my collection where is that in cicero uh, that's in Chicago. Oh, so the main city. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. It's a that's car cool. museum. Yeah, it's uh, two warehouses full of cars. Beautiful cars. Probably some of the most exotic cars you've ever seen. Oh, very cool. And I got a good friend of mine that's going to be uh, bringing his car. He's got a 57 Chevy. Uh, Dick Messino. He's, you know, edible guy, race car legend. You know, he's got his own story. Uh, Dick had a life sentence at one time. Uh, he was a Chicago cop. And uh, in 12 years, he got out of prison at 12 on uh, And uh, we're really uh, good friends with the uh, same attorney, Joe Lopez. We do podcasts with him all the time. Joe Lopez, they call him our Karen Chicago. So oh, he... Yeah, yeah, he does a lot of podcasts with me and stuff like that. We're really good friends. He'll be at my screening with me and stuff. Uh, and Joe's got a hell of a story. You know, Joe represented all the high-ranking members of the Chicago Outfit, you know. Oh, sounds nice. I think I've hit him. Yeah, he did the Family Secrets trial. Uh, oh, you mentioned Big Kelly Breeze. No, he uh, represented nice. him. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, well, Steve, listen, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Obviously, uh, I know you got to run somewhere, and I got I I have also. <laughs> but uh, again, it was awesome uh, having you on the show again. Um, so people can find you on Facebook and stuff like that to check things TikTok, out. TikTok, Stevie Bullets Twelve. Right, and also on Octane Films, they can go there as well. Correct. It, what'd you say? But I said they could go on Octane Films as well to check things out. Yeah. 
uh, with James Forney. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, once again. It was, thank uh, you. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I wish you a lot of luck. And uh, maybe you do a screening here in New York. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to come out to New York. I got a couple friends out there. Good, good. If you do, let me know, man. All right. All right. Take care. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Anytime. Please, guys, like, share, and subscribe to the show. It was another great uh, episode of Mob Tales with me, Nick Christophers, and uh, we'll check you out soon.